We're now going to turn to some methods for finding limits analytically. We'll start by introducing what we'll call some basic formulas for doing this before we turn to more sophisticated techniques um, in the next few lessons. Here's our plan for this lesson. We'll begin by introducing our basic limit formulas. We'll then introduce a couple of other formulas that allow us to find limits of arithmetic combinations of functions. And we'll wrap up with a detailed example that involves finding a limit of a polynomial function. Let's begin with some basic limit formulas. The goal here, of course, is to make finding limits relatively easy. So these formulas, like all good formulas, will allow us to sort of just apply the formula without having to think too hard about what exactly it is that we're doing. And this will uh, allow us to work with analytical representations of functions in order to find limits rather than the more tedious numerical and graphical methods that we've looked at so far. So whenever we're able to from here on out, once we've seen how to do this, we will use these analytical methods to find limits. We will see though that sometimes they just won't work. And in those cases, we will typically then have to go back to graphical or numerical techniques for finding limits. Here's our first formula or an illustration of it. It involves a limit of a constant function. So let's say that we've got a function f and it's a constant function. We'll say that f of x is equal to four for all values of x. So this is the constantly four function. We wanna know the limit as x approaches two of this function. Well, let's do this graphically. Here's the graph of our function. It's a constant function. So its graph is a horizontal line going through all the points where y equals four. I've drawn the graph here with the point zero four label just so we can see where that line is up or down from the x-axis, although that's not really all that important for finding this limit. But the point here is that as you move along this line to the left or to the right, no matter what your x values are doing, your y values will always be four. So as you get closer and closer to where x equals two, you're going to find that y continues to be four. Clearly then, the limit as x approaches two of f of x is four. And the thing to note here, it's probably not too surprising, is that the value of the limit in this case is the same as the constant function value or the constant output of the function. That leads us to what we'll call the constant rule for limits. Basically, it's a generalization of what we just observed about the constant four function. So this is the constant rule for limits. Here's the setup. We've got a constant function. So we know that f of x is always equal to some constant c. It can be any constant you want, four or negative two or five or whatever, but it's gotta be a constant. Then the limit as x approaches a of f of x will always be equal to c. And it doesn't matter what a is. It doesn't matter what our input to our function is approaching. The limit will be the constant function value. So that's the constant rule for limits, our first basic limit formula. Our second one involves what's called the identity function. So this is the function defined by the equation f of x equals x. We call this the identity function because its output is always identical to the associated input. So we're going to look now at the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this function, the identity function. Again, we'll approach this graphically to start. There's the graph of the identity function, straight line with a slope of 1 going through the origin. Notice that the point negative 2, negative 2 is there. Now we're interested in the limit as x approaches negative 2. So we don't really care that negative 2, negative 2 is on the graph. But as we're moving along the graph closer and closer to where x equals negative 2, we're going to find that y gets closer and closer to negative 2 as well. So in this case, it's pretty clear from the graph that the limit as x approaches negative 2 of this function is negative 2. And just as in the constant case, we can generalize what we just observed into a kind of rule that we'll call the identity rule for limits. So this will allow us to find any limit 
of the identity function. Here it is. It says that the limit as X approaches A of X is equal to A. Remember, X is the expression that defines the identity function. So here the limit is equal to whatever X is approaching, the thing we're calling A in this case. So that's the identity rule for limits. And those are our two initial limit formulas. Let's turn now to something else we need in order to kind of build from what we've already done, ways of finding limits of arithmetic combinations of functions. So again, we're gonna have some rules or formulas for this. These involve starting from some limits that we already have and building up new ones. So we need to start with some limits that get us going. So let's say, just to get us started, that the limit as x approaches some number c of a function f of x is equal to l, and the limit as x approaches c of g of x is equal to m. Our first of these formulas gives us a way of finding a limit of the sum of f and g. So let's say we want to know the limit as x approaches c of f of x plus g of x. Well, that's just going to be l plus m. So it's the limit of the first function f of x plus the limit of the second function f g of x. There's a difference version of this that works in pretty much the same way, except now instead of adding, we subtract. So that's our formula for the uh, limit of a difference function. There's one of these for product functions where we're multiplying f of x and g of x. And there we just multiply the limits. There's a formula like this for quotients where we're dividing. So the limit as x approaches c of the quotient function f of x over g of x is L over m. Here, of course, we need to insist that m not be equal to zero. If m is equal to zero, we're going to have to deal with that in other ways. Um, but as long as it's not, we can apply this formula here. And finally, this also works for powers. So if we're finding the limit as x approaches c of f of x to the power g of x, that's just l to the power m, the limit of f raised to the power given by the limit of g. So those are five formulas that allow us to find limits of arithmetic combinations of functions. These all work in pretty much the same way. There's a common pattern to them. So they all involve the same basic idea. If we've got an arithmetic combination of functions produced by using addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, or exponentiation, and we want a limit of that combination, we can find it in two steps. First, find the limit of each of the more basic functions that are involved. So whatever's being added together or subtracted or multiplied or divided or raised to a power. Then combine the limits using the exact same arithmetic operation. If you're adding the functions together, add the limits. If you're multiplying the functions, multiply the limits, and so on. And we're going to see with some examples in just a moment that using these formulas can make the work of finding limits of complicated functions really quick. So let's take a look at an example. We're going to find the limit of a polynomial function by using these formulas that we just stated. So let's set this up. This will actually work for any polynomial function in pretty much the same way, but we'll use it on a particular example. We're going to find this limit here. The limit as x approaches 3 of the function defined by x squared plus 2x plus 5. So to do this, we'll start by applying the sum rule for limits. We're doing that because this polynomial function is a sum of three simpler functions, the x squared function, the 2x function, and the constant 5 function. So let's apply the sum rule. There's the limit we're trying to find, and the sum rule allows us to break that up into the sum of three separate limits. The limit as x approaches three of the first term, x squared, 
plus the limit as x approaches three of the second term, two x plus the limit as x approaches three of the third term, five. So we'll now tackle each of these three limits. And we can find these by using our other formulas that we've already introduced. Once we've got all three of those, we'll add them together in order to get the entire limit that we're looking for. So let's start with the first of those three limits, the limit as x approaches three of x squared. This is a power, and we have that limit power rule that we can apply in this case. It says that if you want the limit of a power like x squared, take the limit of the base and raise it to the power given by the limit of the exponent. So that's what you see on the right here, the limit as x approaches three of x raised to the power limit as x approaches three of two. Now let's look at that exponent. We've got the limit as x approaches three of two. That's a limit of a constant function. And we know from the constant rule for limits that any constant function's limit is equal to the constant function value. So that limit in the exponent is equal to two. In the base, we've got the limit as x approaches three of x. Well, x is the expression that defines the identity function. So we know from the identity rule for limits that any such limit is equal to whatever x is approaching. Here, that's three. So that whole thing on the right side of that equation you see is equal to three to the power two, which is nine. And that gives us the first of those three limits we needed to find the limit of our polynomial function. We'll do the same thing with the, the second limit. This was the limit as x approaches three of two x. Now two x is a product. It's the product of two and x. And so using the product rule for limits, we'll find the limit of each of the factors, and then we'll multiply the limits together. So in other words, we'll find the limit as x approaches three of two and multiply by the limit as x approaches three of x. Now, this is pretty much the same as what we just did with our power from the first term in the limit we're trying to find. That first limit is a limit of the constant two function, so it's equal to two. The second limit is a limit of the identity function. So since we're letting x approach three there, that limit will be equal to three. So that product of limits is equal to two times three, which is six. So that gives us the second of the three limits we need in order to evaluate the limit of our three term polynomial function. The last limit we needed to find was the limit as x approaches three of five. And this is very straightforward. Five there defines the constant five function. And the limit of any constant function is equal to the constant function value. So that's five. So that's the value of our third limit. So let's wrap this up by putting all this together. This is what we were trying to find. The limit as x approaches three of x squared plus two x plus five. We broke that up using the sum rule for limits into three separate limits. And then we just found the value of each of those. The first one was equal to nine. The second one was equal to six. And the third one was equal to five. Add those up and you get 20. So that is the value of this limit of our three-term polynomial function.